Well, welcome everybody to this um, event on stigma. It's a focus on stigma and the care experience. Um, my name is Josh McAllister. I'm the chair of the Independent Review of Children's Social Care in England. And we're delighted to be hosting this event alongside Become this evening with a fantastic panel um, in what is National Care Leavers Week. Uh, the review started in March of this year and we're about halfway through the review. And since we began the review in March, one of the really strong messages that we've heard from care experienced people is about the stigma that sometimes comes with having had an experience in care of, of any kind. Um, since we published the case for change in June, which asked a number of questions about stigma and raised the issue of stigma, we've also had um, hundreds of other conversations with care experienced young people and adults who continue to raise the issue of stigma. So we wanted to create some space in the review and we thought what better week to do it than this, to have a discussion together um, about stigma and the care experience and learn a bit more from each other um, as part of the review process. Growing up in care is a really unique experience. And I think sometimes it's um, the case that people who talk about care or make policy on care start from a negative standpoint but the care experience can give people something really unique and special as uh, as an experience and I've been fortunate enough really lucky to meet some truly remarkable care experience people through the review process um, so far I think that the care experience can give you something really unique to offer the world and part of our job with the review is to help make sure that the world is there to respond to you in a way which uh, empowers you um, and respects that experience. Um, some of the people who have been really inspiring to me are on the call with us um, tonight, which is um, great. And I'm gonna introduce them in a moment. But first, just some brief points on admin. Um, I'm sure most of you will be familiar with um, Zoom and Zoom sessions by now, um, but we're gonna use the question and answer function um, this evening for the event. Um, and please do put in your questions as we go through the event. Don't, don't wait um, until, uh, until the second half, get your questions coming in now. Um, and Sam, who's from the uh, Become team, is gonna keep an eye on those questions and, and help me um, gather them together so that we can put them towards the uh, panel. And we're gonna run from 6.30 to 7.30 and we'll finish uh, on time for people and respect their their evenings and and thank you to everybody who is joining the the evening session so the, the opening question really that i'm going to put to the panel is that revealing your care experience can have consequences does the stigma of care prevent care experienced people having a fair chance to flourish and the first person i'm going to put that question to is far better dressed than i am but it's because he's joining us from New York in the middle of the working day. And that's Ben Perks, who is care experienced and is the head uh, of campaigns and advocacy at UNICEF. Um, I first came into contact with Ben at the beginning of this review after reading a beautiful blog that he wrote that would be very happy to share the link to uh, in the in the chat function. Um, ben, over to you. Thank you for an amazing uh, introduction and uh, for the uh, compliments on the on the blog and also my dress uh, sense in the middle of the working day in New York. It's great to be part of this and we're such great panelists and, and great participants. Um, I think that stigma is uh, for young people uh, from care, for all of us through the life cycle from care experience backgrounds is is very present. Uh, I still feel it at my age, in my job, in this place, far away from the UK. Um, and I think that, you know, we have all the research about the mad, bad, sad, stereotype kind of stuff around, around uh, the wretchedness or the, or the potential criminality of young people in care. And I think we're all familiar with that. I think there are three issues for me that exacerbate stigma for care experienced people. The first one is to come from care is to sit at a relatively small tip of a humongous submerged iceberg of family trauma, of adverse childhood experiences, of abuse, neglect, addiction, mental health, 
all of those problems, we as a society just don't talk about them. And disclosing a background from care is often related to those kind of experiences. Um, so I think that I think the whole of society is traumatized by adverse childhood experiences. I think they affect between a third and a half of any given population. Most people affected have, have not had a chance for a proper conversation about them throughout the life course. So until we solve that problem of talking about adverse childhood experiences, uh, intergenerational cycles of trauma without stigma, I think it's gonna be really hard to talk about being from care without stigma. I think the second thing um, is those that know trauma will know that what's really important is to have an empathetic witness and the care experience population in the UK have never had an empathetic witness. All of the narrative around human rights, all of the activism around human rights in the country has left young people uh, from care out of that conversation, despite the fact that, and I work full time on, on human rights globally, I would say in the UK, uh, the greatest human rights violations that have been committed on mainland Britain have been committed against children in care. I think also that that's um, amplified also by the lifetime outcomes we see for young for care experience people from uh, mortality, uh, vulnerability to exploitation, learning outcomes. All of that um, is just uh, such an unfair inequality that is never really championed by the human rights movement in the UK. And I think this feeds into a narrative that even in our even in the midst of this injustice and unfairness, we are still not worthy of recognition as a, as a, as a group. And I think the third issue um, is related to our own internal working model because, because of where we come from and what many of us, most of us have experienced, we tend to uh, be, you know, we tend to be likely to have issues of self-esteem, of self-confidence, of not being worthy or having the right to belong. And sometimes in my, um, in my, in my life, I've not known where the line is between other people's prejudice and my own self-doubt. And I think that's a, that's a really complicated line. I remember when I first became a, a fully fledged UN diplomat and I would have to go to receptions and, and, and meet presidents and ambassadors and stuff like that. I still, at that stage in middle age, imagine that somebody was gonna walk in and say, come on Perks, well, you know you don't belong here you know we know where you come from out you go and it never really happened and then when I, I wrote that article and it was like almost like a coming out experience within my own diplomatic community I received loads of positive feedback and recognition so you know sometimes the, the, there is the internal working model that can also cause it some degree of self stigmatizing I think all of these three things um, the issue of trauma the issue of no empathetic witness and the issue of self-perception are made much worse by the fact that we're often dealing with poverty. Uh, for most of us, uh, when, we, when we leave care in the years that follow, we're struggling with homelessness uh, and also the risk of exploitation. Um, we are the type of people that organize criminal groups and others try to recruit. So I think all of that, that stuff going on around people trying to create lives out of a care system is a, is a real challenge. That's uh, quite a bit, but I, that, that would be my uh, immediate response to the question. Thank you. Brilliant, Ben. Thank you so much. And there's a lot there for us to chew over for the next next 50 minutes um, with, with the rest of the panel and all of the people who are joining. I think we've now got 180 people, which is fantastic. Uh, Julie, Professor Julie Selwyn, who is a Professor of Education and Adoption at the Rees Centre at, at the University of Oxford. Um, Julie has um, already shared with the review some hugely powerful insights from the Bright Spots work um, and, and other research. And Julie, it'd um, be great to hear your thoughts on this question too. It's, it's difficult coming after Ben. Um, such a powerful start. Um, I want to talk really about what children have been writing and saying in our surveys, the Bright Spots surveys. Um, we've had 10,000 children now complete them. I've, I've been working with Core and Voice on, on this project for ooh, the last five years. And about 10% of, of young people aged 11 to 17 say that adults do things in care that really embarrass them and make them feel shame. Um, and, and actually girls say that more than boys. Um, 
and, and we know that this is it's really important because um just just to talk stats for a minute um there's a statistical association with feeling like that and then saying you're bullied in school saying that you're afraid to go to school because of of bullying because you're in care so there's before I talk in depth about what children have said, there's been three key themes. First is language, stigmatizing language used by professionals. So not just things like contact and being in a placement, but children have written that they've been described as a section 20 by their social worker or the foster kid. So, so the way children are referred to as some kind of other, you know, by, by professionals. The other big area is in school, what happens in school. And children talk about being pulled out of their lessons to have review meetings, health assessments, visitors with their mentors, things that mean that not only does everybody in, the, in their class know that they're you know, in care, but it, it means they, they have to start answering questions about it when they don't want to. Um, th there are other things like, um, social workers coming to pick them up wearing their lanyards or their contact supervisors so that everybody knows that they are in care. So this lack of confidentiality was another key thing. With people just talking about children's personal issues, revealing things about their families, um, parents' evenings uh, when foster carers turned up or social workers just, just having no boundaries and no control over who knew what. And the third thing I think was something Ben picked up was discrimination. So young people saying that they were feeling dumbed down, not treated as normal, not able to have sleepovers with their friends, not allowed to have friends back to their foster carers to play. And here I'm talking about four to 10 year olds. So just normal everyday activities that are part of every ordinary family life, um, young people in care, we're being discriminated against. I'll, I'll stop there, Josh. Thanks, Julie. Um, and from one brilliant um, established academic to uh, another um, soon to be established academic, um, Shauna, um, who is a supporter of Become, um, which is the National Charity for Children in Care and Care Leavers. Um, Shauna is currently studying for her PhD where she's considering social connectedness in care experience people, which is a hugely relevant uh, research uh, topic to the, 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 the session we're running this evening on stigma. So Shauna, your overall thoughts on, um, on this question and also anything specifically from your research so far? Yeah, so <clears throat> just start off in saying that, um, I guess the way that we experience stigma looks obviously different for each individual one of us. Um, and my personal experience of stigma has changed as I've gotten older. Um, I think when I was younger, um, I guess because my friends also lived in poverty, uh, I lived in poverty and okay, my family home looked different to those. Um, I was accepted a lot more, um, you know, they understood and they didn't really judge me for it, but I found that adults in their lives did. So it's like what we were saying before, having to have background checks just to stay over um, and they have this prejudgment of you. You're either going to be naughty you've got to be damaged or you they see you as an abused child and have this overwhelming amount of sympathy for you which is really misdirected oh, oh Shauna. sorry, sorry that's all right no so worries. i guess like these prejudgments reinforces our ideals about ourselves as well and growing up um, and i don't think the media representation helps when we don't see any positive role models or character experience people and we constantly see these hor horrifying statistics and you know the representation that we do have in social media is um very skewed so we have people like tracy beaker or we have like serial <laughs> killers um and you know it doesn't really give us um the best stance in life and that's the way that we perceive ourselves and the way that society perceives us all that they can see us from is the media and what they know about us so if there's only negative representation out there then they're going to view us as negative from the offset and um, and I guess like when I was going up in academia uh, I noticed how isolating this 
being care experience is. Um, and yeah, I think people did treat me very differently just because I was in care. Like I had one incident um, earlier on last year where I went to book driving lessons, literally had the date booked in. And as soon as I said, um, they're getting paid by social services, they dropped out. Uh, and that happened twice. Um, and, you know, there's there's no accountability for that, because how do I go in there and prove that they're discriminating against me just for being care experience? And you can't prove that. I've had like landlords not wanting to accept me for literally no reason. And, you know, deep down that might be the reason, but there's no way of proving it. And I think very much like Julie said, in school, you are automatically isolated. No other child is getting pulled out by a social worker every other day, you know, and um, not having to go to these big meetings. You don't have to report in on, on your social work every time you go out of the house. And, and this automatically isolates us and makes us feel different. And then that is only reinforced from society. And it creates a really vulnerable gap where stigma and discrimination can slip through quite easily. And yeah, there's just no accountability for it at the moment, which is really concerning. And I, I understand that my experience of stigma will not be anywhere near as others. Um, and, you know, um, I think it really, really reinforces our feeling of this imposter syndrome when we do succeed, because we're not seeing others like us succeeding like that. And does that prevent us? from succeeding probably in cases um and yeah i think i think we need to look at the whole system um social services we get stigma from social services either like you say you get referred to as a foster kid luck child um you know you are different um, and if we can make the whole system see us as one or at least a protected community then we have a chance to kind of fight this stigma hopefully um but yeah Donna, thanks so much. And picking up on, I think that point that um, Ben was making about the how tricky it can be to navigate the difference between your own self doubt and the prejudice that you face because of your care experience. So thanks, thanks for sharing that. Um, and then finally, over to David, who is a board member uh, on the Experts by Experience board for the review. I've learned a huge amount from David. Um, he's got a distinguished career um, behind him as a broadcaster. Um, and now works with a number of organisations, including the NHS, um, to emphasise um, user voice. Um, David, what are your thoughts on, on this question? OK, well, I mean, to be honest with you, I felt a lot of shame and stigma when I was in care. Um, part of that was because I was in a town where there weren't very many black people, and the only black people who were there were those who were in the children's home. So I always felt very sort of um, conscious of it then. But to be honest with you, um, I was empowered by being involved in NAPIC, the National Association of Young People in Care. And that it almost, if you like, that was my coming out period because I was expected to go and talk about being in care. Um, I ended up doing, you know, a couple of TV interviews and um, the response I always got from that was really positive. Um, I, I would say that um, I couldn't hide about I couldn't hide from about the fact that I'd been in care when I started to apply for jobs because my job title before was that I was a representative of the National Association of Young People in Care. So when I mean I when I first applied to the BBC, I can honestly say that I I think because I was honest about my care experience, that actually helped me um, to get a job. Um, the other thing was that like a lot of boys from the care system, I also went to prison, so I've got you know that baggage as well. And my, 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 my attitude was always that I needed to be honest about this. I think when I was a kid, I created this fantasy of world around me to deal with what I was going through. And I, you know, and so I didn't let people know why I was really in care because it was so hard to accept and say that my parents gave me up. That was so difficult. So I created a story and a fantasy around that, which actually, you know, people believed. Um, but actually, when it came to, to the real thing of, of going to work, I felt it was better for me to be honest. The other thing is, when I started becoming a TV reporter, I also wanted to get all my baggage out there. So I agreed to make three, two documentaries about me, one about my experience in care and then another one about my experience in prison. And um, 
to, it never did it never did any harm to me to do that um actually what what it meant was that i had other people from the care system coming to me and saying to me how did you do it how can we do it you know and and it was a way in which i could actually go back and help other people um and i would never deny that i was in care i'm not embarrassed or ashamed about it now in fact anything i'm proud of the fact that i grew up in care and that i did actually manage to make a go of it i was this morning doing uh, an event for hertfordshire where my message to the to the young people was very clear you can do what you want the fact that you have been in care we're special people you know because we've been in care we've had to sit in meetings with social workers and goodness knows which other kids don't have to do and it gives us an understanding i'm certainly about systems and uh, all of those sorts of things it really gives us an understanding i'm not saying it's great to be in care or anything like that but i'm saying there are positive things you can take from it and i feel i've just lived my life to try and be honest and to try and make it easier for other people to to come out if you like Wow, what a um, what a fantastic set of contributions from people. Um, there's so much uh, to get into for the conversation. Um, I guess just reflecting on a couple of the comments, um, Ben, you talked about um, almost the need for there to be a human rights movement around this, and and that's been something that's been missing. And and both you and David talk about. Um, coming out and, and needing to tell people your story and, and explain to people that you, you were in care. Do you think that a key part of changing this is going to be having a liberation movement, having, having a, a political movement for change led by people who are care experienced? Is that something that we need? And, and David, I know you mentioned NAPIC um, and your involvement with that was, was a liberating process. Is that, is that something that we need now? Um, aside from the care review or following the care review or as part of it. Is that a question for me or for David or for somebody else? Anyone, Ben, you're off mics, on you go. Uh, Yeah, I I mean, I think a movement, if if, if you need a movement to get to the outcome you want, then great. But, you know, um, Shauna and Julie will tell you that really the science and the understanding of what children really need for good mental health and outcomes is, is all there. So that should be embedded in the reform. If there is gonna be a movement, uh, the only movements, and I I work on this as an advocacy, a global advocacy guy, the only movements that work are ones that really focus on a single issue. You think about Me Too uh, against harassment in the workplace, you think about Black Lives Matter against police brutality, you think about Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, the end of apartheid. So it has to be a a unifying issue that is a Trojan horse for all of the other issues that affect young people in care. And I'm not sure, I hope we could build an agreement on what that single issue would be. I think that before the 1989 Child Care Act, which was massively improved outcomes for kids in care, uh, there were a number of single issue movements that did have impact. So if we're going to have a movement, it needs to be built, built around one basic idea. You can't go to government and say, there are 300 things that you need to do to improve the situation of young people in care because nobody can align behind that and nothing will happen. A review can do that, but a movement can't do that. Um, I mean, I, I, I would say, oh, I'm going to disagree with you, Ben. <laughs> I, 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 I think that, that there is need for um, ex-care experienced people to be involved in the decision making um, for the future of, of the care system, um, you know that's why I'm on the. That's why I'm involved in the ex by, by experiences. But I, I, you know, I think there is a lot of scope. There's a lot of people out there because of the reviews happening um, that are excited and that are thinking about actually setting up an organisation. Uh, you know, I know there's movements with. There's an organisation now for social workers who have been in care. You know, <laughs> these are the things that have just been developing recently. Um, I thought. NAPIC, I, I think it was a real shame that NAPIC ended. It was a Labour government under Frank Frank Dobson who stopped the funding to NAPIC. Um, and I believe that there were a lot of things that NAPIC were hearing about at the time that are only just coming out now because these things take a long time to work through the wash. And I'm talking about ill treatment and bad things that happened to us in care in the mm-hmm. 80s and 90s. So, you know, and, and, and as an organisation, maybe we were getting letters from people. We were talking to other young people who felt that this was a place they could come to to say what had happened to them rather than going to the state and the system. And so I, I would really encourage 
an organisation that could be there that's represented by people who are in care and have been in care that can have a relationship with government as well and can have an influence over policy. Thanks, David. Julie, were you going to comment? Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just that one thing that worries me about policy is that we've had so many policy changes and nothing changes. So, for example, if you take the example of um, uh, needing permission to go for a sleepover, since... I've gone back to 2004 and found the letters that have gone from the Department of Health to directors of children's services saying that this is not necessary and you shouldn't be doing it unless it's for, I can't remember how many hours, but you know, like several days staying at somebody else's house. Um, and yet it still happens just for a single night. So we've had multiple letters, multiple policy changes but it's something about having to change the culture and and um, that's harder to do. Yeah. And, and of course, each local authority interprets the policies to what they can afford, what resources they've got, so on and so forth. We all know, people in care know, that you can be in one borough and get one deal and another borough and get a completely different deal. And, and the thing is about all of this is that actually a lot of care follows poverty. And you've got some big poor boroughs like Hackney, um, you know, who've got hundreds of kids in care. And then you've got wealthy boroughs like Kensington and Chelsea, who've got a minimal amount, of, you know, a, a smaller number of children in care. So they've got less kids, more money, and, and the situation's completely different, you know? So that, that's one thing that really gets my go is that you don't get a fair deal when you're in care. It depends where you're born, postcode lottery. Shauna, did you want to come in on this? Yeah, I completely and utterly agree with the postcode lottery. We see it all the time that like you can literally look at, at the money that is spent in certain areas with the population of kids and it is just not fair. And it, it sets us off on a bad start already, um, which is completely not our fault. It's not our fault we're in care in the first place. It's not our fault we've been given that hand. Um, and I think... Yeah, for myself, I absolutely do think care experienced people should be driving this policy change. We have so many higher up people in places of power making decisions of our lives. And that is a real issue for children in care. When you're in care, you have no control over your life. You feel like constantly being controlled. And when you turn an adult, it's the same again. So why can't we take up spaces in these higher positions of power and actually make a stance for ourselves. And I completely agree with Julie. There is policies that have been out there for, you know, I, I'm only 23 and I speak to care experienced people in the 60s and 70s and they we have similar experience, which is absolutely terrifying. Uh, I can speak to some of the 23 year old and we same, share similar traumas and similar issues with the care system. So yeah, we are in a position where, okay, not, much has changed. We have made slight changes in certain areas, but what else do we do mm -hmm. if we don't drive for that change? Um, and I think, like I said before, I think just changing a policy isn't good enough. It, like we need to do it from every inch of society. We need to change the media, we need to change politics, the education system, social care system, and only then would you have actually a fighting chance of actually implementing these changes really. Um, and yeah, I'm, I really do believe things like NAPIG should not have been dropped. I've heard about the wonderful work that it did do. And I think it's an absolute disservice to the people in care for losing such a vital service like that. Um, because like David was saying, he was felt empowered. And one of the most empowering things I did was get in touch with care experienced people. I didn't know anybody until I was 20 um, about care experienced people. And when you actually make this, reach out to your community, people that you identify with, it can be so empowering. And then the stigma and discrimination that you do experience, you can stand in solidarity with each other. And if we have national organizations led by people like us, people we identify with, that can be so incredibly powerful. John, I just wanted to support that in that, you know, one of the things about the Bright Spots programme is that is that each local authority commissions this survey. So they they do they do want to hear what their young people are saying. And where we've seen change in local authorities, it's been driven by the children in care councils. So for example, if you look at um 
uh, West Sussex, for example, their results on stigma really horrified them. Mm. And children in care council got together with um, the virtual school and their corporate parents. And they, they changed it so that they agreed that no meetings were going to be held in school time. The, the nurses agreed that no medical assessments, no health assessments would be done in school time. So there was, there was general agreement across all the professionals that this, wasn't, this was going to change. So I think the children in care councils at a local level could have a big impact as well. I just say something very briefly about children in care councils. I think they're excellent. And in fact, I've been working with one today. They organised today's event. But there's only a particular type of young person who gets involved in the children in care mm -hmm. council. Uh, the, the vast majority of children in care are going through so much at the time that it's not, you know, I, there are great rewards from, from having been involved in them because of the confidence it gives you, the, the opportunity to challenge the system. But it's only a tiny, small percentage of the people in the care system who can actually deal with that at that stage in their lives yeah. they're great i, I agree I, but they can no. drive change david for the rest of 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 the children who are in care well, at local authority one of the other um one of the other questions i wanted to ask before um moving over to the the audience and their questions i know we've got lots of questions that have already been submitted which is great was um the other side of this so if part of the answer might be um, the, the, the power of a movement of care experienced people coming together and, and leading that process. Another part of it might also be change in legislation. And, and what, do, what do each of you think about the question we've asked in the case for change so far about having a protected characteristic for the care experience under the Equality Act? Um, is that something that would 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 assist in sort of making progress on this and raising awareness and making organizations collect data and uh, providing a legal entitlement would there be unintended consequences to it are there things that you know the review hasn't thought about and i'd encourage people um uh, on on the call as well to please add your own comments about this question into the, the chat function too i don't know if anybody wants to kick off I think given that the, the outcomes and the disparities and the, and, and the human rights situation of uh, children in care and care experienced people, I think it's, a, it's a, a bit of a travesty in a way that it's not already a protective characteristic. That would, that would be my view. A lot of nodding there. I mean, I, I work in, you know, I work in equalities and equity, and I, I absolutely think that it should be a protected characteristic. I mean, I, we, before we started, a panel member was talking about having problems getting accommodation, driving lessons. There are loads of ways in which we can be discriminated against. And so I just believe that it would be good to so that we can challenge when we feel we're being untreated fairly, uh, treated unfairly because of the fact that we've been in care. Yeah, I just want to echo that. I think it's absolutely necessary that we have this protected characteristic. And I understand um, that there might be some concerns about that because um, some people might not want to identify as a care experience person mm -hmm. once they leave the system. And that's absolutely fine. It shouldn't be uh, you know, an absolute necessary thing. It should be an individual choice, just as it is if you want to declare your sexuality. Um, and it comes down to like when I applied to uni, I ticked the care leaver box and that was mm. my choice. I was in control of that choice. But what it means if we do have legislation out there to say that we are a protected characteristic, it leaves accountability for when we do experience discrimination and hate crimes. Mm. Um, and, you know, we all have them individual experiences where we've doubted ourselves is somebody discriminating against us because of a care experience or do they just generally not want me to get in their car <laughs> and, and that, that's what I I kind of went through I, when I got rejected from my driving lesson after I told them I was care experience and I guess if I was a protected characteristic I would have been able to investigate that and actually hold the people accountable um, and it is an absolutely necessary safety to protect the, our whole community how else are we meant to keep each other safe really um yeah thanks shauna julie was there anything you were gonna add is there i guess is there anything from research on this that might there, is, there isn't really anything from research but the children in our survey often want to keep it secret they say they don't want people knowing they hate the judgment stairs 
Um, we had a comment from one young person who was due to get an award, one of um, the kind of children in care uh, awards this, uh, ceremonies. She said she, she wasn't going to go because she was frightened she might be in a photograph. And then mm -hmm. would see that she got an award. Um, so, 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 so the stigma is, is, is felt very strongly and, and it creates a lot of anxiety. Um, so I think any pressure to say that you've been care experienced might have a, a negative impact unless there was a lot of support around young people. I think you have to be ready to, to, to say it. Yeah. yeah. And I did say in my piece at the beginning, I was terribly ashamed and embarrassed when I was in care. So I, I do understand that. Um, and I, I just wish that we could be confident to just come out and say, yes, I was in care. But you know what? I can do it, everything. Yeah. We talked before, didn't we, Nicole, about the um, LGBT movement and the progress and changes that we've seen over recent decades. I'm gay and was you know really lucky to be able to come out when I was 15. But it was really because of lots of changes that had happened before I was able to do that and I think you know we need a society that's there and willing and and and, and able to celebrate and um and recognize care experienced people so look on 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 that and there's a lot more to get into um I'm going to turn to Sam who's been keeping an eye on the questions and the comments and Sam are there any particular questions that you you you've seen come up repeatedly that we should we should put to the panel. Thanks, Josh. I'm going to do my best to capture some of the key messages and questions from the chat, but it's really, really active. So apologies in advance if you don't feel like I managed to convey your question um, or your point to Josh. There's a, a huge amount of insight there, and we will make sure that the chat and the QA and um, a sort of is, is released afterwards as well. There's, there's three kind of key things which I, I've noticed come through. So maybe if I give you a choice, Josh, then you can sort of take one or one or two of these to the panel. Um, one of the points which has been made in a few places, um, I've noticed from Anthony and Heidi and others, and actually from Shauna in her introduction, was around where and who this stigma and prejudice comes from. Um, and predominantly, actually, that's from professionals themselves who work in children's social care. Um, and I think that backs up what sort of we hear it become. You know, rarely do we find that care experience young people themselves have low aspirations, but actually it's the professionals in their lives who hold those low aspirations for them. So I guess maybe a question for the panel around um, sort of how you can sort of boost empathy and understanding in the professional community, particularly. Um, one of the other sort of topics I've noticed come up is around identity more broadly in heritage. Um, I think it was Narinda who asked a question around the importance of life story work and its role in supporting identity and a sense of belonging as a care experienced young person. And it's one of the key things we've heard through all of the all party parliamentary group sessions this year as well. That sense of knowing who you are is a real important precursor to being able to connect with others who share that kind of experience or identity. So maybe a question for the panel there around that importance. And then the, the final sort of one is particularly around media repression. Um, I think Diana sort of mentioned a, a question earlier, when we move away from that Tracy Beaker narrative of, of care experience and thinking about um, how to sort of do responsible media reporting, how to do responsible and empathetic and effective representation in TV shows and films. So maybe, maybe a question for the panel um, around that too. Thanks, Sam. Um, a lot there. So what I'll try and do is maybe put a question to each member of the panel and if anyone wants to come in just just come off mic and tell me to pipe down and, and, and jump in um so the, the question which has been asked by a few people but particularly Anthony and Heidi which is where and who is this stigma coming from and, and maybe what can we do to shift the attitude of professionals um Shauna I think that picked up on a point you made I don't know if you wanted to come in on that yeah, so um, I think the main reason they come from professionals is because in social services, um, what, whatever you do, you are faced with these statistics of how the child is behaving in your local authority, what's happening, what are the education and, and attainment. Um, and the whole training around, um, I guess, social services is safeguarding. How, how do we protect these children rather than how do we empower these children? What are the positive stories that are coming out of the care system? And I guess um, I've kind of felt this on the other end of the stick when I have done well, kind of use, this is 
not the best of the trophy child, like uh, somebody to represent the whole cohort. And that's not right. Not everybody wants to go in academia. Nobody's really bothered if I'm achieving well in that. We need positive representation from every single sector, every single hobby that there is. So then a child can look and go, oh, that's somebody like me. I can do well like that. And I, like I said before, I think I don't think this is something that we can change just within professionals. Um, I think, okay, we can get them training and we might become more aware as professionals not to use certain language or behave in certain ways. But then they go home and they're exposed to the negative reinforcement of the media of us and how society perceives us. I think, I think in order to kind of address this discrimination that we kind of experience and this stigma, something systematically needs to change we can't just change one area and hope that because professionals are behaving a bit better that we might feel a bit better about the situation so yeah I think I think overall I think we do need to have just more positive representation that sounds a lot more simple than it actually is and a removal of this negative stereotypes that we do see so in research I'm constantly seeing statistics about homelessness drug abuse and like mental health but where's the positive statistic like I can't find the statistic about how many care leavers end up with a PhD I'd love to know um, and why aren't we seeing that like I don't know how many others there are of me uh, and that's really damaging and um, so why would young people strive to them levels that they never thought they were going to reach because professionals never thought they were like I never got brought to uni opening day I never it was brought to like look at like colleges and stuff like that and maybe somebody would have done that it maybe made me feel like the professionals did have my back and they didn't and they didn't actually think that I was going to amount to nothing um, and that's kind of the reinforcement that you do kind of get um, and that's really difficult to get rid of when you become an adult and that's where the imposter syndrome kind of kicks in at a later date <laughs> so yeah I think we just need a whole system change I, I, had a really, I had a really bad experience where a senior manager who was in my department when I was a kid, I was given a job to work with him as a professional, as I am now, and he refused to work with me. He didn't want me on that job because I'd been in care. It was the same authority that I'd lived in as well. And I mean, you know, that was just the most awful thing that could have happened. And professionals need to stop doing that um, because, you know, that was really unprofessional, I thought. But he actually stopped me from getting a job because he knew I'd been in care. And the last time he saw me, I was on my way to prison. Well, that was 30 years ago, mate. I was told... 40, as a few, sorry, 40 years ago. <laughs> given away your age there, I, I was told as a 15-year-old that children from care didn't go to university, that it was impossible, it would never happen, completely, you know, beyond any, any realistic expectation. And Ben, just on, the, on, the, on this question about media... And the media portrayal have you i mean you, you work in campaigns and advocacy work where you know in a way the, the the winning ticket is if you can change the public narrative around things are there examples of that changing either in the us or elsewhere that you'd point to or any other reflections that you've got about the media portrayal and how it shifts over time of particular groups one of my major pieces of work is trying to eradicate abuse, neglect and adverse childhood experiences globally. That's a campaign that UNICEF and the World Health Organization are just launching next month. So we look at the way that the world talks about adverse childhood experiences. And just to give an example, the, 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 the level of conversation and understanding of it is increasing dramatically. And we have, um, uh, you know, if we looked at articles about adverse childhood experiences over the past 10 years, the graph would be like this. So it's really become raising to the level of consciousness. What's very interesting in, in the Oscars, um, I think it was a third of the 2020 Oscars had a storyline of Child, child neglect, and then children making, like Alton John, all of that, a, a neglect or abuse, children becoming adults, having dysfunctional or very difficult starts in life, making solid connections, and then recovering. And I think if you look at the trajectory of a lot of young people from care that are doing reasonably well, that's a similar trajectory. So I just think we need to throw some, some storylines about young people from care into that mix to tell that story. If you look at the, the way the media has dealt 
uh, has addressed racism in British society, one of the things that anthropologists and sociologists tell us is that it was the fact that there were positive images of um, different uh, ethnic groups in our society over the years uh, through comedy and drama that really changed the way the world sees. So, so one of the things we do in advocacy sometimes is we will contact a production company for a major uh, drama or a soap opera and, and try to influence the script writing to, to follow a storyline. Um, so this is something that we can talk about and work on together to see if we can really bring those those images, that, that those ideas that highlight the, the struggle, the challenges, the dignity and the successes of all of our care, care family. And, and again, we should refer to um, Lem Cisse's supersonic campaign. Again, you know, to see a list of people who are famous, who have done well. Some of them we didn't even realise they'd been in care. Yeah. And to see that is empowering to us as well. So, you know, things like that need to happen and we need to see, you know, again, you know, if there's a cat, you're right, Ben, if there's characters in soap operas and things like that, but it's unfortunately because soap operas are soap operas, they usually scrape the barrel of any situation for the drama. So we've got to be careful about where we do, because again, otherwise we end up with another Tracy Beaker situation. I remember when Tracy Beaker was on, you had kids wanting to come into care because they like Tracy Beaker. Yeah, I was just going to say as well, um, there's some incredible people in the care experience community who write about this um, and there's a blog about this who some of you know really broke it down about how Tracy Beaker has really impacted the stigmatisation of care experience people. And um, also another care experience person called Rosie, um, she made the care experience that Culture Archive, which has the most incredible work of all care experience people in media, poetry, you name it, anything creative, and it's there. And we need that to be amplified and platformed more. We need to see more of that. Um, like when I try to think of like kind of famous films and stuff like that, that's got care experience people in. I cannot think of a positive representation of us. The only thing that I've seen is like um, independent films and stuff like that. So yeah, I think something nationally needs to happen. And if there are care experience people making areas in this and it, People need to pick it up, really big names, and amplify that further. Thanks, Shauna. With um, the, the question that Narinda asked about identity, um, Julie, I know that Bright Spots does try to get into some of these questions. Does it ask about life story work in particular? And if not, are there any sort of broader reflections from... It, 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 it asks, as an adult, explained why you're in care. Just a simple question like that. And... Uh, the children and uh, care leave, it's asked of children aged four to 18 and again for care leavers and I'm sorry I haven't got the, the statistics in front of me but I can remember that 50% more than 50% of children aged four to seven say no one's explained it to them and they don't wow. and they they write things like if only I knew why I had a social worker I might feel better mm. it begins to decrease as you move into the teenage years, but even in the teenage years, I think it's about a third, still don't really know why they're in care. They've never, they feel like they've never been told the whole story. And that remains for care leavers as well, who are still saying they didn't know why they were in care, a proportion of them. I think life story work is, is a very skilled piece of work. We have children's social workers who, don't have much training in it, have give, are not given any time to do it. And I know from my work in adoption that sometimes life story books are done in social workers' own time. You know, they're doing it at the weekend and there isn't any time in the working day to do something as detailed and as intense as that. So we do need to think about how, how children, how that history is, mm -hmm. is is put together and, and how children are told, because some of it involves some quite difficult conversations about what has really happened, you know, um, rather than being told mummy was too ill to look after you story. Yeah, and how it changes as, as young people get older. older. Ben, I think, yeah. sorry, I think Ben was gonna come in and then David over to you. Yeah, I just, I think Lemsey Say again, made a brilliant po uh, point in his book, uh, uh, the absence of shared narratives. I remember that by the time I, I think I was 18, I'd had 20 different addresses across London and Birmingham. And I 
I didn't know where one started and the other ended. And, and I had no shared narratives from relatives or people that were consistently, uh, you know, throughout my life. And then what we see is when people are older and they want to go into therapy and begin to kind of work through some of these things, they've ended up blocking it all out. Then they're not able to go back there and to really understand their childhood and to know the person they were as a child. And this is extremely yeah. bad for people's mental health. Uh, mm you know throughout the life cycle so i think the the importance of uh, storytelling of helping the young person to build a cohesive identity as you have said josh to, to try to main, con, maintain contact with the place they come from all of these things are extremely important for the kind of coherence that generates good mental health and good well-being throughout the life cycle yeah sense of identity david over to you i, I was just going to say i'm nearly 60 and I'm still trying to piece together my life. Um, I had my mum's truth, my dad's truth, and then social services truth. And then none of it was the same. And so I, I just think that's, a, uh, you know, it has been for me almost a lifelong struggle to, to find out, you know, what happened to me and why. So we, we have to take into consideration that there are all these different versions of what happened. I, I'm being honest, the social, tell the truth. I was just going to jump in um, and say I don't think your care lever records help that and um, when I got mine there was redacted lots of lies and misinformation um, and you know that doesn't help when you're trying to piece things together when you just come in of I guess like how I understood it was um, when I was in the care system it was about survival it was like get in get out and just survive this situation mm. so when I um uh, Got in, a, I finished my undergrad and I sat there and I was like, I'm going to try to make sense of my life and got my care leave a record and never been so confused in my life. <laughs> it's just like, and then when I tried to reach out to services, I like, um, spoke to Become, the Reese Foundation, loads of amazing charities that work with children in care. And the reality is life story work is aimed at young children. But maybe we are in a position to do that life story work when we're younger or if we are, it's not offered to us. So what's left when we're adults? Like, I'm 23. I have no idea where I identify as. And I'm just starting to really feel empowered by my care um, identity. But then there's other parts of me. I'm a white British woman, but fr from the age of zero to 11, I was brought up um, in the GRT community. I spoke Romani in my house. And then soon I went into care we did never ever touch that so now I'm left in this like very confused space and I'm sure I'm not the only one I know I'm not the only one I've spoken to other people so I think it's a very needed funded thing and you know when we look at mental health uh, care experience people unfortunately it is very poor and having a sense of identity and understanding of your traumas and what's happened and how to process it is our only fighting battle against yeah, having the adverse kind of experiences from them early life traumas. And I think having identity crisis is um, byproducts of experiencing trauma as a young age a lot of the times. Um, and the more that we can do to kind of help make sense of all the chaos that might have happened really does help. And I think very simple stuff like I'm saying with Ben, I, I couldn't name you where I've lived. I have about 100 addresses. So when I apply to a house, I'm like, oh, I don't know. And I think very simple stuff like that, somebody just chronologically explaining where you lived at a moment in time can really help you out over, yeah, over your life, really. This is, I mean, it's an issue that we've heard so much through the review so far um, that, that, that your, your sense of self and identity can get lost through care um and and then we leave people at the end of it to try and search for that and without without much help and uh, it's definitely an area that we're looking at in the in the review in terms of recommendations um sam have there been any other sort of reflections i can see there's been lots of comments as as the panel have been answering those questions lots of people agreeing um with with what people have been sharing is there anything in response to what's just been shared that's worth um the, the panel considering or um are there any responses to the the question we asked earlier about the protected characteristics that's maybe worth dwelling on definitely and, and again apologies for not probably doing just the quantity of the quality of the comments justice um yeah i think really 
fair to say sort of mixed views on the question around protected characteristic, a lot of which was explored by the panel earlier. Um, lots of interesting comments around the role of language um, and sort of the importance of getting that right, but sort of also recognising the limitations of just language in itself without the kind of surrounding cultural change. Lots of discussion around kind of public understanding and reflecting on sort of articles that talk about the applications and planning for children's homes, particularly um, thinking about sort of different roles for other people who are maybe outside of the care system or who want care experience themselves or how to be good allies to those who are care experienced. Um, and yeah, and some interesting conversations as well around those who have maybe left the care system through adoption or through an SGO or similar, who may or may not re-enter care at some point in the future again. And, and again, navigating, I guess, that, that sense of identity through some of the um, sort of uh, strict statutory uh, environments there. Um, yeah, those are the sort of a few of the things I've been able to pull out from the chat. Great. Thanks, Sam. Some really great comments there and, and reflections um, about the discussion. Um, we're nearly at the end, and I've just got one more question to ask on a, uh, on, a on an upbeat note, re really, which is for the care experienced of you on the panel. Um, have there been particular conversations or relationships or moments in your life that have been liberating for you to share your care experience? David, you mentioned NAPIC. Maybe could you say a little bit more about what that felt like? And Ben, I know you were around at a similar time. Um, and then Shauna, would love to hear from you if you've got anything to, to offer on that as well. Yeah. So just say it again, the question again, Josh. Yeah, it'd be great to hear from you about any conversations or moments that stick in your mind where it felt really liberating to share your care experience. I'm gonna I'm not showing off here. I can honestly say that because I was involved in the Prince's Trust, I had some amazing conversations with the Prince of Wales where I felt sorry for him for his childhood. Um, and I was actually, I was I actually that. feeling that my, child wasn't, my childhood wasn't quite so bad. I mean, I, I know if you're going to be anti-royal and they've got money and everything, but he had a miserable childhood. <laughs> and what, oh, yeah, So you, they, you, you were in a conversation with him and yeah. you, you told him about your care experience. And I, and I told him that I'm not sure I'd swap with him, to be honest. Yeah. We're both brought up by the state. Very good, David. I love that. Ben, what about you? <laughs> it's pretty. I can't follow that. That's that's fantastic. Um, that's a brilliant name drop, David. Um, I don't know. I, I felt the first time I really was heard and talked about it was when I was fifteen. I'd been kicked out of three schools. I was in my fourth school, and this teacher showed an interest. And I think that was a game changer. And one of the things that I think is really important in all of our advocacy for young people in care is that they all have a healthy relationship with a fantastic teacher wherever they are. That's something we should have as a goal because that was certainly a game changer for me. I was also part of NAPIC. I learned so much from David and other others in that early process. I, I got involved when I was 16 and that was also a game changer. So much of um, what we've heard in the review is that people's experiences are sort of made or broken by one or two um, almost chance relationships with people that, that that go above and beyond. So that definitely chimes. Shauna, final word. Um, I would say when I was younger, um, it, that kind of empowerment wasn't there. Um, and definitely not in school, I guess, because I was misbehaving at school because the reactions at home when I went into care, it really didn't make any difference. <laughs> relationships were gone by there. And I think, um, I went to uni, wanted a fresh start, I clicked the care experience, but I kept it to myself and just told people around me. And then in my last year of my undergrad, so I would have been 21, I think. Yeah, 21. And um, my supervisor just turned around to me and she was like, what is your background? And I got speaking to this professor and um, we ended up being like really great friends, still speak to them now. They've really supported me throughout the years. And, and I turned around and I was like, oh, I was in care. And it was the first time ever somebody said something positive to me about it they turned around and it was like wow you must, must be so resilient you must be so proud about everything that you've achieved to get here and I was just like oh this might be a positive thing and then um yeah I, I really threw myself into the care experience community through a fellow care experience person who I met at a talk and from there, I just thought it was like the most empowering thing ever. Um, and I'm so glad I did it. Like I've, um, I'm part of a network called Reclaim 
um, and we're all care experienced people who come together for a monthly chat and we might just have a brew together we might talk about things that we wish we could change and I think that's such an empowering thing because all right I, I didn't leave care with any strong relationships whatsoever I don't speak to anybody from care but now I have my own care family and like a sense of community and a sense of belonging and I'm just so grateful that there is people like that um out there and I, I just wish it would have been there when I was a bit younger when I really needed it but you know late is better than never um yeah and, I, and now I see my care experience is like empowering if anyone's got anything bad to say I will fight you and shoot you down about it <laughs> um, and I'm in a very privileged position to do that because it's took me a long time to understand my identity and my story and how I became here and only now I find it empowering I think we need to do more for to other care experienced people to feel that way um, so they can feel empowered to shout back at the people Definitely. who may be discriminating against us Shauna, that is a fantastic point to end on and a great message for the review to take away as well. Um, huge thanks to Become for co-hosting uh, this evening. Uh, massive thanks for the nearly 200 people who joined us and all of the questions and comments um, that you added and for being part of this really important conversation in National Care Leavers Week. Um, to David in London and Julie, I think you're in Oxford. Ben in, no, <laughs> Ben in New York and Shauna in Liverpool, and from me in Cumbria, thank you very much. It's been great to be with you and uh, look forward to the conversation continuing. See you later. <laughs>